Hello and welcome to NPO Showcase. I am Joel Van Kuyken. And I am Sister Barbara Hansen. It's unusual that Sister Barbara and I are on the set at the same time, but we're here today to pay tribute to Dirk Koning, the Community Media Center's Executive Director, who passed away on February 10th. On January 11th, I interviewed Dirk. We talked about the acquisition of the Wealthy Theater and how the Community Media Center is planning to utilize this new opportunity. When Dirk died a month later, this interview became a poignant reminder of the strength of his ideas and his ability to lead through vision and the power of possibility. NPO Showcase is a program that serves nonprofit organizations by giving them opportunities to tell their stories to the community. Its formation and its evolution is a good example of how Dirk's vision of building community through media is applied on a regular basis. It's ironic yet in some ways it's fitting that the final interview of our third year of production was with Dirk. His message was clear. The wealthy theater was becoming part of our vision. And the Community Media Center's mission would now include a restored vaudeville theater that was originally built in the 1900s. After the interview, we'll talk with Chuck Peterson, the new CMC Executive Director, about the wealthy theater and the current status of the capital campaign. Welcome to another episode of NPO Showcase. I'm Joel Van Kuyken. NPO Showcase provides visibility to the many nonprofit organizations in the greater Grand Rapids area, organizations that improve the quality of life in our city and throughout our community. My guest today is Dirk Koning, Executive Director of the Community Media Center. We'll be discussing the Wealthy Theater Project. Welcome to the show, Dirk. Hey, thanks, Joel. My pleasure. Let's start right at the top. Why did we... Community Media Center by the Wealthy Theater. Well, it so happens about a year ago they got a hold of us and uh, indicated that they wanted to partner. And um, we had done some research um, into some facilities in the neighborhood because we have three different departments of the Media Center that are located outside of the Bridge Street facility. So um, we have outgrown the four walls here on Bridge Street, the Westside Public Library. We don't want to kick the library out of the first floor, not that they'd leave anyway. So we had people spread all over town. We needed more space. Um, they came to us on a partnership plan and we looked into it and we just couldn't really partner with them at the time. This would have been about March of last year. And uh, we, ended, we realized that they were having some financial troubles and some po political troubles with the board. So we kind of backed off and said, Thanks, but no thanks. And unfortunately for them, um, their problems manifested in uh, closure uh, of the facility. Mm -hmm. And so then we took a fresh look at it and said, okay, um, now maybe we could make this work. Um, it was, it was, folks were kind of skeptical. It was not a rah-rah, let's rush into this gung-ho. I remember a few early staff meetings and board meetings. It's about 50-50 people going, well, I don't know, how's the theater fit into the m mission of building community through media? Um, but the more we looked at it, the more we thought about it and realized we could expand our services. About 30% of our members live in that uh, area of the town, and a theater venue could fit nicely into media center activities. So um, we're, we're pretty excited about the possibilities now. Well, I think, you know, some of that, I guess if you want to call it fear among staff, is well, a little bit well-founded because, sure. I mean, it's a theater. It's a, it's a totally new thing for us. And it, we still, we build community through media. That's our mission. But maybe at that point, and we're still developing, how's that going to tie into wealthy theater? I mean, maybe that's something you can speak to as well. Yeah. How can we bring our mission to that part of town in the form of a theater that needs to be sustained? Doggone good question. Um, <laughs> I don't have all the answers. We have several committees together working it out. It's kind of an organic process, which is how the media center operates in many levels anyway. It's not a top-down dictate, you know, where I wake up with a dream and say, we're going to do this, you know. Um, it kind of gels and people come up with ideas. So what we've realized is it isn't that unusual. We have 24 hours a day of FM radio space that is just naked. It's just sitting there. And we have to program that. And there's a plan that WYCE put into existence with 80 volunteers who pull from 11,000 CDs and 2,000 public service announcements a month and fill 24 hours a day of a venue of FM radio. GRTV and Livewire, 24-7, 6 megahertz of TV bandwidth sitting there naked waiting to be fed. And GRTV has a plan, Livewire has a plan. So in some respects, a 400-seat theater 
that will have programming is not unlike this room that has programming at GRTV and 88.1 that has programming. It's just that there's less electricity involved. <laughs> it's a big space. Um, so what we think we're going to do is what a theater, this theater which was designed for vaudeville and film, film in the early days, um, we're going to run some films in it. Uh, it's naturally suited for that. We're going to make it available to the public to rent it for community events part of the time. And then we're going to electrify it. We are going to bring over high-speed broadband internet. We are going to bring in live television potential and a small hot studio and cameras so that a venue like a theater can be live like uh, Austin City Limits or you know, live from the Apollo, the kind of things you see on TV. So there would be music um, there as well. Music is a big part of it too. Some of it will be broadcast, some won't. Uh, some will be interactive. Some, maybe there will be music involved with film. Uh, lectures wrapped around films, satellite uplink and downlink, so you could do a teleconference there. You could stream an event from that venue out onto the internet. Um, you know, so it's really got potential far beyond the traditional approach of a film theater um, or even a music venue. I think all facets of the media center can come into play with using that space, not unlike we use other electronic space, but using that physical space to augment electronic space and build community. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you when it really hit me, Joel, is mm -hmm. we, um, we did uh, It's a Wonderful Life and we put it on the big screen and you would think, who hasn't seen that film? I mean, that has got to be the most overplayed uh, kind of syrupy Christmas story in the world. Mm -hmm. But we said as a gift to the community, we're going to get a nice film print of it, put it up on the big screen, and we had 350 people at each of two showings and I sat through one of them and the emotion in the room, the people talking, the buzz beforehand, people coming up to me afterwards just going, oh, this was so great for my family. Thanks for doing this. This was wonderful. Can we do it again next year? And I'm thinking, probably so. But when it came to building community through media, the media was that film and that venue and that theater and the energy in that room and the goodwill and the community spirit. I, it, it sunk yeah. it right there. It's like, yep, we're onto something. That's here. very tangible. I mean, that's something <laughs> you can touch. You know, we talk about that on a daily basis, but to see it in that light, it's, it's a good way to look at it. Absolutely. I, I think you know we're taking missions within our affiliates, and we're we're seeing all of that coalesce and taking elements of what we do and in, in putting it into that venue. That's what's exciting. Yet allowing the public to have a chance to to program it and to use it. I mean, Absolutely. Um, what are some of the things, I mean, we have more than just the theater there. There's the annex. Um, talk a bit about that. I mean, how are we going to utilize that annex? What, what are we going to see um, next door to Wealthy Theater in that space that is also part of the purchase? Yeah, um, what some people don't realize is there are two big buildings we're talking about here. 1130 Wealthy is actually the theater and a support building that they, they bought a while ago and, and knocked holes through the wall so that the theater and the support building are one uh, entity. Two doors down is about a 6,500 square foot space. They called it the annex. We'll probably call it CMC Wealthy Street. Okay. And similar to what people can do when they come down here to 7-Eleven Bridge Street, take a class on media and technology, use equipment, technology equipment to tell their story, and then transmit their story on radio, television, or on the internet. Um, there'll be a version of that at 1110 Wealthy Street. And so people who it's more convenient for them to take a class there, check out a camcorder there, do some editing there. We're going to have a hot studio and a storefront window that you can actually broadcast live from. So somebody could do a call-in show. We could be sitting in the storefront window at Wealthy Theater with Doing neighbors walking by, cranking this exact show out in the future. So um, it will be not really a branch. I don't want to call it so much a branch. It's just an extended facility that you can do mm -hmm. most everything on Bridge Street, and you can also do most everything on Wealthy will electronically bridge the two facilities so that anything that can happen here on Bridge Street, high-speed internet traffic, satellite uplink, downlink, radio, television broadcast, that will all be available and occur out of Wealthy. So we also have been talking to various groups because there's a little more room there than we need. Mm -hmm. And we've met with uh, at least half a dozen folks now who are talking about renting one of the large rooms in that secondary building. And it could potentially be another like-minded group that wouldn't necessarily be an affiliate of the Media Center, but would act as a catalyst to our mission, whether it's a sound studio for recording capability. We've talked to somebody about a local restaurant that might be in there. We've talked to an arts group about 
arts uh, activities. So I think it'll things. be fairly vibrant, yeah. that second building. And I think it'll be much more convenient for a lot of people who live essentially from South Division South. That will be the South uh, East facility, and this is the Northwest facility. And to people in that community who haven't really made it down to our Bridge Street location mm -hmm. as well. Um, I think there was a misconception early on that we were actually moving right. to that location, and, right. and uh, that's not true. I mean, I think we've had to tell a number of people that, no, that's not the case. And we really have kind of grown. We do have separate locations now housing some of our affiliates and branches of GRTV. Um, and now it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a nice place to really have these two distinct locations where right. we got a little room to expand a bit and, and fill up some extra space. Yeah, I mean, if there's ever such thing as the power of the press, it's really uh, apparent or evident when they get it wrong. Because yeah, uh, a reporter, um, you know, we never, I, I never mentioned anything about relocation, and it was an assumption on a reporter's part, and it was a big story. And I've had to, you know, answer to a lot of people, including the Neighborhood Association here. I mean, Big O's wanted to yank the Dirk's Chicken Deluxe off the menu if, they, you know, yeah, if, can't the, if we were going to leave here. So it's like, <laughs> heavens forbid. No, we are on Bridge Street. We're going to be part of this Bridge Street community for a long time to come. We have a long-term lease that runs through 2017. I don't see us going anywhere. Um, this just, you know, it, it, there's, more, there's more good to go around. And Absolutely. so we will be on Bridge Street. It won't diminish services on Bridge Street. It'll just expand services to Wealthy Street. Let's touch on what may be some of the negative ramifications involved with purchasing this and some of the things that we may have to face as an organization and the community. Can you, can you talk about that? Money, money, money. Okay. <laughs> location, location, location. Um, this is an expensive proposition. We're talking about a 1911 uh, vaudeville theater that has big drafty doors on the front and it has a monster heating system about mm. the size of this room in the basement. Um, there's a reason that people have had a little trouble keeping that open. We're going to keep our over overhead low because the media center already has an executive director. So they had an executive director, we don't need another one. They had a finance director, we don't need another one. They had some engineering and, and you know production staff, we have engineering and production staff. So if everybody expands their efforts a little more, um, we're going to keep overhead down. So from a cost standpoint, we'll be, um, <clears throat> I hope, in pretty good shape. But we're raising money. There's a capital campaign people are going to be hearing about soon. We set it at $2 million. The media center is going to raise $2 million to augment services mm -hmm. over there, to connect the two facilities, buy the equipment it takes to electrify that theater. And most importantly, I think, uh, to leave a legacy, is we're going to do an endowment. And what that means is you raise a bunch of money, somewhere around 700000 ultimately, because we have 300 already in an endowment. We want another 300 or 350 You tuck that money into an account at Grand Rapids Community Foundation. You never touch the principal. But then the interest is available every year for heat, gas, and electric. Ah. So you set aside a big chunk of money, never touch the base amount, and that trickle value of interest, which is going up a little bit, that amount keeps coming in, and it'll cover some of your basic costs. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to hustle so much to make the insurance payment or hustle so much you know, to pay the, the gas bill or the uh, electric bill. So we, we do have a business plan. It shows us breaking even in about 24 months. The Media Center has a proud history of uh, balanced budgets in 23 years. I don't want to violate that now. Absolutely not. Um, so that, the downside is that it's a, it's a, it has a degree of risk. It's, um, it's uh, modified by our approach, and thank God this community has some benefactors who are generous. We've already had the Weggie Foundation, Steelcase Foundation, Grand Rapids Foundation step up to the plate and put us at about 700000 toward that $2 million. So we're well on our way, but we've got a long ways to go still. Okay. Um, uh, I, I just I want to speak a little bit to that theater itself. And, you know, those that now have come before us the work that they did to bring that facility from the brink of destruction and um, restore it and get it to a point where we have an opportunity to now run it and program it. There's a lot of work that was done in that area. And a, and a lot of people that, um, I, I hope those people are remembered for the, the work that they did and the legacy that they really helped preserve. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too because... Um I think as Gerb uh, Eifsting, who works here, put it, we're standing on the shoulder of giants because right. in 1997, the roof collapsed and a portion of the theater blew out the floor all the way down to the basement. And when I saw the pictures 
frankly, that building shouldn't have been rebuilt. <clears throat> I mean, if you were looking at it as a pure development mm -hmm. model and a cost-benefit analysis kind of business mm -hmm. approach, you'd look at mm -hmm. it and go, hey, y'all, this thing needs to be you know, put out of its misery. But a labor of love, a capital campaign that took about two and a half years from 97 to late 99, Mayor Hartwell, who was, who was uh, just George Hartwell at the time, was mm -hmm. one of the co-chairs, they hustled up two and a half million dollars Brought that thing back from a dilapidated, you know, open ceiling. You could see the stars. You could see down to, you know, nearly down to hell. And they put the money into that thing, renovated it almost to its, uh, uh, you know, original status of 1911. Brought in an architect from Ann Arbor who researched the colors, the original colors, dug up some original blueprints. Um, they did it right. And uh, you're that's, absolutely right. We we put their uh, initial donors' name tags right on the chairs. So we're giving them right. as much respect for the beginning as we can. Well, thanks a lot for coming on the show and chatting with me. It's my great. pleasure. Keep up the good work. Okay. And thank you for watching this segment of NPO Showcase, a regular feature of GRTV. Stay tuned for the second segment. And if your nonprofit organization wishes to be showcased, you can contact Barbara at 459-4788, extension 213. Well, Chuck, I understand we now own the wealthy theater. Is that true? It is true. In fact, I, it, the reality really um, has sunken in. I was, actually got to sign the papers and saw my name on the documents, and uh, it's a very exciting time. We've been talking about it happening for so long. It's, it's nice for it to be finally a reality. It certainly was a part of uh, Dirk's vision, and why don't you say a little bit about what your relationship with Dirk has been over the years? Well, I've, I've worked with Dirk for over 17 years, and before that I, I was a volunteer and I was on our board briefly before I was hired on as staff, but um, Dirk and I have worked together f from way back when the CMC was just GRTV. That's how we started, you know, and, you know, part of Dirk's, you know, genius in the field of access has been that he recognized the idea of diversifying, and it was, he, on a national level, he really... Um, coined the phrase community media center. It was his idea that occurred to him after we acquired the radio station for uh, WYCE FM and he started going on the national circuit and talking about how um, we, we can't just be about public access anymore, we have to be about community media and that ripple was felt across the country and, and um, that's sort of been Dirk's legacy is, is to think broader than just television, to think media, and, and this wealthy theater is just another chapter in that. So bringing the wealthy theater then just continues to expand that idea, and so uh, we're in the midst of a capital campaign. You want to bring us up to date on that? Well, yes, um, Barbara, we've, um, as you know, it's about $2 million that we're trying to raise, and what a lot of people don't realize is that it's not just for the wealthy theater. We've, as you know, we've acquired the wealthy theater. Um, the rest of the money that we're raising is to put the technology in because that's what makes the community media center the community media center is having access to media and so um, what we want to put in over there are um, equipment and training and facilities for people to come in access media at a very high level and to express themselves and we're going to at the uh, second building over there the CMC Wealthy Street We'll, we'll have something similar to what we have over here with GRTV, but in addition, we're going to have a drop-in center for young people so that they can um, produce media that can be seen not only on the channel, but also in the theater. Um, we're talking about also having a monitor in the window so that um, the personal documentaries done by the neighborhood children can be um, seen by passers-by in the street. They can walk and see not only um, trailers for what movies may be coming up at the Wealthy Theater, but they'll also see stories from people who live in that neighborhood, and they'll, they'll get to know the neighborhood a little bit. And it certainly will bring them together as a neighborhood and probably be a very new uh, piece for that. I think it was the idea of the Wealthy Theater and the whole renovation years ago to Absolutely. have that happen, and now this is a whole new way of doing it. Absolutely. I mean, our, you know, we're all about community, and so I think that's why we're the perfect organization to, to step in and run the wealthy theater because um, you know we understand community and we're going to be building community and our capital campaign is called connecting communities and it's based you know part of the idea is connecting this bridge street community on the west side to the uh, east side community over at wealthy street 
and, um, and also just the communities around the neighborhood. It's sort of on the cusp of three neighborhoods. And, um, you know, one of the things that we'd like to do over there is to do a tribute to Dirk, since this was originally Dirk's vision, and it's, that vision remains within us because it was such a, a powerful mm -hmm. vision, and, you know, it's our mission, which still guides us today. Um, there is an alleyway between the buildings that's sort of a walkway between the parking lot and back and then the front and we'd like to make sort of a peace garden that was that was sort of Dirk's style was you know he was um, very much into the concept of, mm -hmm. of peace and um, I think a little later we're going to hear about his bell story this is a classic Dirk story he had many stories that he told very well over and over and mm -hmm. um, one of the favorite stories was this bell story. And one of the ideas that we had for this peace garden would be to do some kind of sculptural um, rendition of the bell story, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a tribute to Dirk. So that's gonna be part of our capital campaign. There is integrated art is in part of the budget. That's something that Dirk believed in. And in fact, on a national level, they've talked about a Dirk Koning um, certification for, for <laughs> Um, community media centers mm. and that certification we based on whether you've integrated art, whether you have an attractive building as opposed to just a dumpy, uh, what Dirk called a vanilla box. Mm -hmm. um, Dirk was very much about having, you know, some style to it. And, um, you know, we hope that, well, we know that Wealthy Street is going to be the same. And, you know, very much looking forward to this tribute and, you know, expecting people all over to be able to contribute mm -hmm. to that. And that bridge idea, because it bridges the two buildings, too, then, by uh, having the little peace garden out between the two. Yes. Um, lots and lots of good things happening. So how far are we in the capital campaign? Well, we're uh, almost halfway. And again, that, the first phase was acquisition of the building. So mm -hmm. we've gotten that far. Mm -hmm. And uh, the foundations in the community have been great. And that's who we went to first. In subsequent phases, we are going to be asking, you know, businesses, uh, smaller foundations, and individuals for um, for contributions because that's all going to be part of it. Every, I mean, it, it is about community. We're going to value even the ten dollar donations Certainly. that come in, and, and, that, and those are important in this kind of a campaign, and they can really make the difference. So, absolutely, it's very very exciting. The community is going to buy into this whole mm -hmm. thing, and so mm -hmm. anybody can be part of this. And you're really excited about what's ahead, aren't you? Absolutely. I, hopefully you can see that, but it's, uh -huh. it's a very exciting thing. I mean, years ago when we talked about expanding, we, we sort of envisioned what, you know, what would be nice to have, and we talked about having a venue, but that would be a great catalyst for our, our media community, would be to have a, a place where people actually gather together to physically look at media. And uh, a theater was mentioned very early on, and... We never were thinking of wealthy theater at that time, but when wealthy theater came up as an option, yeah. it was just a perfect fit. Good. Well, our time has run up. Uh, we know Dirk was a big man with big shoes, and, and you're filling him really well, Chuck, so thank you. Thank you, Barbara. One of Dirk's last consulting jobs was helping the city of Grand Rapids build a wireless internet canopy. Last fall, he addressed the mayor's advisory committee on wireless broadband to talk about what it meant to help bridge the digital divide specifically in a village in Malawi, a small African country. Here's Dirk. Uh, just to name a few, he's testified before U.S. Congress. He's been on uh, a guest on Good Morning America. He uh, is a graduate of leadership Grand Rapids. He was the winner of the Grand Rapids uh, Bar Association Liberty Bell Award in 2002. Uh, which is provided to a non-lawyer who has exhibited community service that has strengthened the American system of freedom under law. And my resume doesn't look anything like this, but uh, we're proud of him that he's from Grand Rapids. He's done a lot of work uh, on wireless and the planning of it, particularly in the, these United States for great cities like uh, Seattle and Atlanta. We're very pleased to have him associated with our effort. Dirk? Right. right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kurt. Uh, appreciate that introduction. A lot of familiar faces. This is exciting time. I'm really uh, wired up, no pun intended, about this to get this thing going. We don't know what we're going to do yet. You're truly here in a capacity to help us decide. There are a million and one questions. Um, it really is great to be back home. As Kurt ran through that list, I was realizing that uh, you know, for as many years as I've been on airplanes going places to help people, this is one of the best uh, uh, opportunities that 
Grand Rapids and, and the mayor and, and manager and assistant manager have given me to put back into this town. So I guess you don't have to be 500 miles away to be a consultant. Uh, you can actually be right in your own hometown and I appreciate that. And before we get going, my notes aren't up here, so we'll wing it. Um, so I'm going to tell you just a short story about a really uh, uh, embarrassing discovery I had once in not asking people what they need. Um, it was shortly after Nelson Mandela was elected and it, he invited a team of people to, to Cape Town to, actually we're in, in Malawi, which is a little country north of South Africa, to design community media centers to jumpstart democracy in some of these townships. And there's no electricity. These are villages that look like they've, you know, they've been there for a thousand years and things haven't really changed much. So we all thought we were pretty, you know, hot shots. We went into this planning session and we came up with satellite, you know, downlink capabilities. We were going to use grass huts with solar powered roofs. We we're going to use some wireless uh, connectivity for the internet. We were going to have low power radio and this was all going to be available, subsidized by the government to put in these small villages to jumpstart, you know, democracy, economic development and these kind of things. So we had big plans and we walked about an hour and a half into a little village um, that Mandela had a cousin in. So there's a little, I guess a lot of politics are the same. So we're doing his cousin's neighborhood first. And we explained to the village chief and his two assistants, we're gonna bring this solar powered hut and we're gonna bring the satellite signal down for television and we're gonna microwave internet in and we're gonna have low power FM. What do you think? And there's a nice pause because in their culture there's a gap between words unlike you know our radio talk show mentality here but there's a pause and he learned his English from the Brits and so he said um, that's all very interesting but what we really would like is a bell and we kind of looked at each other he said you know a bell on a tall pole you ring it one time and we gather in the middle of the village you ring it two times and the well is dry you ring it three times and the storms are coming and we're like oh, what idiots we are we didn't ask them <laughs> you know we had the answers we had the technology we had it all figured out we're like we can do bells we can do bells yeah yeah all right we can do that and then not to patronize me one another he went on further and said i've seen your television and i don't want it <laughs> and it's all rupert murdoch stuff out of out of star sky and it's really baywatch is the number one show on the planet right now so Maybe that's why some people hate us, because they see Baywatch, for God's sake. So anyway, says, I've seen your television, I don't want it. Um, the internet is interesting, but it's all words, and we have 5% literacy. Got me on that one. And radio could work, but we have 11 dialects within our region. 11 dialects. So we went back, we ta talked to a Dutch foundry, we got some bells, and we regrouped, and it turned out now there's a, it's called Bush Radio Network. There are small radio um, towers that each cover the particular dialect of the region. They own and operate it. They program about half music and half things like AIDS prevention, water purification, crop rotation. I mean, really fundamental, fundamental uh, applications of the technology. So you're the start of our acquisition of input from the community. We're going to have some live call-in shows on the public access channel, GRTV. We've got a website under construction. We've got a voicemail box that if you get a great idea in the middle of the night and you want to just call extension 215, we'll publish all this. You can leave your message on the voicemail box. Anything possible to get community input and interest because, you know, you're the ones who are going to use it and it should uh, hopefully benefit you most.
notes aren't up here, so we'll wing it.